Welcome class to chapter three, lead morphology and placement lecture. As we all know, as an EKG tech, we will be taking what we call electrocardiogram or an EKG. Some newer doctors or new cardiologists, younger cardiologists are now saying ECG, which is the same thing as EKG. You just say ECG because it is electrocardiography. There's no K. So basically, electrocardiography is a recording of the heart's electrical output that is recorded on a special EKG paper by the use of electrodes that are placed on the limbs and the chest that creates leads. As we all know that we learned in class while taking EKGs that we know that the electrode that is on the right leg is what we call a grounder lead or ground electrode. Basically, we put the leads to get different views of the electrical activity during certain times of what the heart is doing to find to make sure that the heart is working in a normal pattern and if there are any abnormalities that we catch it and that we recognize it. So when we print out the EKG or the ECG, it is called an electrocardiogram is what the printout is called. As we know, each lead, there are three different types of leads that, core, that make up an EKG. We have bipolar leads, augmented leads, and pericardial leads or chest leads, or sometimes you'll hear it referred to as horizontal plane leads because the chest leads takes the horizontal view or electrical activity view of what the heart is doing at that particular time. Bipolar leads is the first lead we'll talk about. Bipolar leads, the reason why they're called bipolar is because they can have either a negative or a positive pole. The three leads that make up a bipolar lead are is lead one, lead two, and lead three. Lead one reads the electrical activity from the right arm to the left arm which makes the left arm positive and the right arm will be negative. Lead two reads from right arm to right left leg, which puts the left leg in a positive pole, meaning the right arm is in a negative pole. And then we have lead three, which reads from left arm to left leg, which puts the left arm in the negative in the left leg in a positive. So here's a diagram. So if we take lead one is from right to left, see right is negative and left is positive. Right arm to left leg, right is negative, left leg is positive. Left arm to left leg, negative left arm, positive left leg. So that's lead one, two, and three. If we join the lines together, it makes a tri axle diagram. So if we basically take lead one, which reads right arm to left arm, and sorry, my lines are not straight, it's hard to draw on here. I like the board. All right, that's lead one. And then we have right arm to left leg, that's lead two. And then we have left arm to left leg, which is lead 
3. And this forms the triaxle diagram. And there's a better picture about to show up. There it is. Triaxle. Diagram. It's a little better than my drawing. The purpose of Eithoven's triangle is basically to represent the leads one, two, and three and how they end. So basically, what correlates with the triangle is Eithoven's law, which states that lead one plus lead three will equal lead two. Basically, that's talking about the height of the QRS waves. So if we add the height of lead one plus the height of lead two, I'm sorry, if we take the height of lead one plus the height of lead three, it should equal to what lead two QRS height is. And when we say the height, we're measuring how tall the R wave is. So when we look at Eithoven's triangle, it helps us to determine if we have any abnormalities or help us to fix any abnormals due to wrong placement of the limb leads or limb leads just not placed in the right area or the correct way. So this helps us in determining to make sure that we are placing them in the right position. So this is Eithoven's triangle. So this is right arm. right arm to left arm and that's what lead one and then we have lead two which is right arm to left leg Whoop. sorry about that Left leg. Come on, make a G. There we go. Left leg. And I guess I can fix this T, huh? All right. Then we have lead three, which is left arm to left A leg, which makes up Eithoven's triangle. So lead one plus lead three equals the height of lead two. It's a pretty little triangle. So if we take the height, the R wave of lead one plus the height of lead three, it should give you a taller high peak in lead two. Because if you take 11 and six, it gives you 17. And you'll learn how to count height. Uh, in later chapters on how we count the height or how tall an R wave is in later chapters. This is more or less a visual we're looking at. The next lead we'll talk about are called augmented leads. Augmented leads are unipolar leads and they're mostly positive. These are also limb leads as well. You have the AV in augmented means augmented voltage. So the A, the small A means augmented. The large V means voltage. R stands for right arm. AVL stands for augmented voltage left arm. And AVF stands for augmented voltage left foot or leg. So basically, when we're reading AVR, it's measuring towards the right arm. And when we measure an AVL, it's measuring towards the left arm. And of course, AVF is measuring towards the left leg. And as I said, all these are positive leads.
uh, I did it. So our augmented leads plus our bipolar leads are what we call frontal leads. These leads are our limb leads. And if you join them all together, they make a diagram called the hexiaxle. So basically you're adding on to the triaxle and now you have an ex a hexiaxle being that all three of these leads are all limb leads. They're just projecting vi different views of the electrical activity that is going on in the heart. So this is just the augmented lead. So we have AVR, then AVL, and AVF. But when we put them together, we have the hexiaxle. <clears throat> the last leads we'll talk about is the pericardial leads or chest leads are, as I said before, some books reference it to the uh, horizontal plane leads. These are also unipolar leads that are positive. And we have V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. All these leads are placed within the ana inter uh, intercoastal spaces of the chest. So lead one is usually placed on the fourth intercoastal space on the right side of the sternum. That's why we look for the sternum and we place it on the right side in the fourth intercoastal space of your rib cage. Same thing with V2, but it's just on the left side. V3 is usually placed between V2 and V4, which is on the fifth in a, uh, in a coastal space of the chest. V4 is also placed in the fifth in a coastal space. V5 is on the axillary plane which the axillary plane <clears throat> is the invisible plane where we take our collarbone or our clavicle and we draw an imaginary line straight down. That will be placed on V5 on the fifth intercoastal space of the rib cage. V6 is paced axillary or mid axillary or axillary. This is your armpit, basically right underneath your armpit, not in the armpit, but underneath it on the fifth intercoastal space of your rib cage. So as I said before, intercoastal spaces are spaces in between your rib bones. The mid clavicle line is just an imaginary line that's right down in the middle of your clavicle or your collarbone as it's called. Uh, anterior axillary line is the invisible line from the axillary or armpit and then you have your mid axillary line which is in the middle of your axillary or armpit <clears throat> i'm briefly going to talk about continuous monitoring only because it is very brief and it is very understandable and it's, it's brief basically when we have continuous monitoring this is for patients who are been hospitalized due to some type of coronary this abnormality, abnormality, or um, they have a history of some sort of cardiac design uh, disease. So when they're placed in the hospital, they're placed on a continuous monitor, which basically a continuous monitor just has three leads, or sometimes you'll see a few that have five leads. These patients who are on continuous um, monitoring, they're EKG readings are sent to a department called telemetry, which is the other field you can work in as an EKG tech. You take your telemetry tech and you work as a telemetrist. So basically these continuous monitoring uh, readouts are sent to a secluded room in the telemetry department. And if the telemetrist sees any abnormalities that are going on with the patient, they alert the nurse and the nurse will go check on the patient because sometimes it's just that a lead had fell off and they just have to double check to make sure that all leads are still on the patient. Or the patient could be just up brushing their teeth 
and it's not really anything life-threatening. They're just brushing their teeth and the vibration of them brushing their teeth is causing their EKG or continuous monitoring to go crazy. When we do continuous monitoring, we have to adjust where we place the leads due to patients' possible movement and shifting within the hospital bed. So we'll use the most commonly used leads that we will associate with continuous uh, monitoring. It's we will place lead two, MCL1 or V1. The reason why we would do lead two, because lead, remember lead two is on the left side, which is your heart is where? Off center to the left. So, and we would also use V1 because of the fact that it is right at the bottom of the heart or right on the side of the heart. So if you take a look at this, they have lead two, which has the positive electrode. And then we have MCL, which has a positive in the foot in a cubal space right here. So we have two different ones. Now, this is the most important thing that everybody must remember. This is the Bible of EKG. This is how we determine if we have a good EKG reading or ECG reading or not. The electrocardiographic truths are just that. They are the truths of an EKG. So if we know a positive QRS is only written if an impulse is traveling towards a positive electrode, so meaning if you have an upright EKG or an upright QRS, and when we say an upright QRS, we're saying that the R wave, it's in the upper deflection. So this is your baseline. Your R wave is above the baseline. If we happen to get a negative QRS, that means the R wave is below the baseline and it's traveling away from a positive pole. And if we get an isoelectric, that means is the electro, we picked up an electrical current that is perpendicular to a positive pole. And when we say isoelectric, it means it's very close to the baseline because remember baseline can also be called the isoelectric line because it's very close to the baseline or isoelectric line. And of course you have flat line, which means there's no impulse at all. So these are the EKG truths. So see your R wave is in the upper deflection. So that means it's positive. If it's traveling towards a positive, it'll be upright. If it's traveling to towards a negative, it will be upright. And if it's traveling perpendicular, it'll be isoelectric, which means it's very close to the baseline. Normal QRS deflections, this is how we read to make sure that our EKG, our ECG readings are coming out the way they're supposed to. So when I tell y'all to take a look at your EKG readings when y'all print them out, basically what I'm looking for is for your QRS to follow these normal deflections. So the first ones we're gonna look at is of course your limb leads, which is lead one, lead two, lead three, AVL, AVF. All those should be in the positive, have positive QRSs. The only limb lead that has a negative QRS is AVR because it's traveling away from a positive electrode. So, that's why the normal vector, because if you're doing AVR, it's traveling, if this is positive, it's traveling away from the positive into the negative. So therefore your QRS will be 
negative. <sighs> All right. Normal QRS deflections of a pericardial lead or chest lead. We know V1 or MCL1 for continuous monitoring and V2 should be ne negative because they're traveling away from a positive lead. V3, V4 should be isoelectric, half up, half down. That's what isoelectric means. V5 and V6 QRS should be in the upright or positive deflection. And these are just pictures of telling you. So this concludes chapter three's um, lecture. It's very short, very sweet chapter. Um, but as I said earlier, make sure you know these EKG truths and the normal flow of how um, each lead is supposed to look because it does play into a factor as we advance throughout the chapters in EKG. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. If you have any questions, feel free to text or message off of Edmodo. And everyone have a nice day. And I will hope y'all have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I'll see y'all on January 4th. Bye and thank you.